got your Bibles, you just follow along with us. We got a lot to cover today. Amen. Uh, as I, you know, I'm going to have to skip another one as we hit Mother's Day. I've got some thoughts from Mother's Day that's probably a little different than what I've done before. But uh, today we get back on the statements of Christ, what he said on the cross that literally changed everything. Had he went on the cross and stayed mute, we would not have heard, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We wouldn't have understood how important when he told Peter to forgive 70 times 7. That would have just been a sermon that he preached to Peter about having to deal with John. But on the cross, he showed himself that he practiced what he preached. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Had he been mute on the cross, the thief would have went to hell if he would have just stayed quiet when the thief said to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Had he muted himself and to many times we allow pain to stop us from saying something nice. Say it again, preacher. Many times we allow pain to stop us from saying something nice. We had a phrase back home in Alabama, hit dog barks. You hit a dog, it's going to bark. And oftentimes when I hear people barking about stuff, I realize they got hit. I said for years that, uh, what did, what, what's the phrase? Cheryl, you might have to help me here. It's escaping my, my thinking. Oh, hurting people hurt people. So it's a warning to you that when you're hurt, and Jesus, no one that I know of, in life had been hurt more than he had. He was not put out of his misery, if you would. He was abused. He was beaten for hours. He was spit upon. He was humiliated. They removed his clothes. They nailed him to the cross. He's had bloodletting and, and, and just is in sweat. He's cramps. And yet in that moment of pain, instead of lashing out, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Oh, if he'd only muted himself. Imagine the thief would have never made heaven. Amen. Sometimes in your deepest pain, you got to learn how to say something nice. Can I get an amen? You got to say something nice. Amen. And, and it just blesses me to know that, that it can happen and you can do it. If he had been muted on the cross, his mothers would have never heard the commission. Today, son, I want you to take care of mama. Amen. Releasing her to John when he said to her, woman, behold your son and son, behold your mother. Amen. Speaking about his mom and releasing her to the cares of another man. He could have been mad. He could have used some people on that last one. They're hurting so bad. They're going to say something mean. They're going to lash out. They're going to say that last little thing to hurt you. Amen. Careful, saint. You ain't no, you're not what you once were. You're a saint now. Everybody say saint. saint. Amen. Look at her and say saint. Don't look at him. We know the truth. <laughs> But I'm telling you right now, the Scripture, and I understand our sin. I understand we struggle with things. But oftentimes when we hit pain in our lives, man, we want to just lash out. We want to say something. Speaking of saying something, I do appreciate having my friend, my brother from another mother, Richard Goldlightly, here with us. He's, uh, he had the funeral for his father on Friday morning, came out, worked at the camp on Saturday. Appreciate him being out there and all the volunteers and staff that did so good with the camp. I thank you, man. That, that's huge to me to see that go over so well. And then to get back to Owen Rich, I will say this in front of the people here because you need to hear it. I get home, and I hear yapping out on my front door, and I look, and Richard said, oh, yeah, by the way, there's a stray on the front porch. I look out there, and there's a little bitty dog sitting out there on the front porch. And I said, why is that dog on the front porch? And I looked at him and realized he had fed that dog on my front porch, which simply means that dog is still right now on my front porch. And the reason you're here today is because you get fed in this house. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. That's why we come to you. That's why you watch online, because you get fed in this house. If you get fed in a place, you hang out in that place. Can I get an amen? And I will give you enough money to have the little girl dog spaded if you'll take her from me. Amen. Because I got a feeling when I get back, she's still going to be on my front porch. Why are you laughing? No, don't welcome me, because if that dog ain't gone, by the time you leave, that dog going to Arkansas with you. 
and I'll give you a sack of food to take her. Fourth statement from the cross we find in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. Darkness. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Silence from 12 to 3. Nature rebelled. God covered the wickedness of men with darkness. He was forsaken so we could be forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is a powerful time for you to be in church today, amen, to understand that what Jesus went through was for you and I. Can I get an amen? Amen. He was, he was made sin. Amen. For us. Why, why did God forsake him? And, and you got to understand, not many miles away set somebody who was going through a struggle in life after 16 years and four months and three days, amen, with a family to know that he now has been married that long and now that he has cancer, he got a big mortgage, two kids that need braces, lost his job, angry, yes. And when you hit a place like that in life, I know seven, eight months ago when my wife come down with cancer to hear the news that I don't repeat from this pulpit, but to hear it, I thought, my God, my God, where did you go? Amen. This ain't supposed to happen to the pastor. Amen. To his wife. And yet it happens to all of us at one time or another. Can I get an amen? Amen. You're going to hear it sit in your life probably before it's over. Lord, where did you go? Amen. I've prayed. I've fasted. I've given. I've done everything. Where did you go? It's Friday morning. It's Jerusalem. A crowd is gathered on the north end of town just outside Damascus Gate there at Golgotha, the place of the skull. The Romans, they, they like it because the hill is beside a main road. That, uh, that way lots of people can watch the crucifixion. Amen. On that day, more people than usual have gathered. They come out. It's a, it's a macabre. Amen. Way of looking at things. This human fascination with a bizarre, very horrible time crucifixion. But it drew people. This day seems like any other, but it's not. A man named Jesus being crucified. The word spreads like wildfires, reputation, the healings, amen, the blessings, the, the fish and the bread multiplied. The people began to show up, but there's no one neutral there. Some believe, many doubt, a lot of them hate. Three hours of darkness. At noon, darkness fell upon the land. It happened so suddenly that no one expected it. One moment, the sun was right overhead. The next moment, it disappeared. It was not, listen to me, it was not an eclipse, nor was it a dark cloud cover. It was not something you could explain. It was darkness itself, thick, inky, black darkness that fell like a shroud over the land. It was darkness without any hint of light to come. I can't explain it. Again, it's one of those mysteries that took place last night coming in from Tulsa. I looked ahead. I saw lightning down uh, 45 south, and I said to my son, that's dry lightning. That's, that's not, it's just, it, there's no rain in that. You just see the lightning. Oh, was I deceived. As we hit into the darkness, the deepest rain flashes are flashing everywhere, and I realized it came suddenly over us. The rains hit. I couldn't hardly see to move down the road. I had to drop my speed 30 miles from how fast I was going, which now I'm traveling the speed limit. But everything slowed down for me, and I can't imagine this moment when the darkness is covered over. It, it's 3 p.m., and just as suddenly as the darkness had descended, disappeared. Voices now. A man leans over to his friend and cries out, what in God's name is going on here? Mortally wounded, suddenly Jesus screams out four words. Eli, Eli, I'm not so back tonight. The words in Aramaic, the common language of the day, the words from a question that screams across Skull Hill and drifts across the road. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's hard sayings of Jesus. The words we can understand, but what do they mean? You know, the story is told that the great Martin Luther was studying this text one day. He sat for hours and looked at those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Amen. Silently pondered, and then suddenly he stood up and explained, God forsaken God. How can this be? Think about it. God forsaken. In other words, the only man in the history of the world that has ever been forsaken by God was God. Jesus, the only one that's ever been. You've never been forsaken. 
You may have thought you had, but you've not been forsaken. He's always been with you. He walked with you through the hospital. He's been with you through the mall. He helped you through the school. He walked with you through divorce. He walked with you through the death of a spouse. He was there with you when your parents passed in this life, Richard. He's always been there. He never backed away from you. Amen. Maybe you denied. Maybe you didn't realize it. My God, I've, I've been thrown off my motorcycle on my way to the ground. It was Jesus. I've been thrown off my horse on my way to the ground. Jesus. I got married. Jesus. Come on now. Can I get a Jesus? Jesus. Amen. This is the God forsaken man. That's who he is. In that moment, on the cross, God the Father turned his back on God the Son. The word forsaken is a strong word. It means to abandon, to desert, to disown, to turn away from, and to utterly forsake. you got to understand, when Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? It was not simply because he felt forsaken. He said it because he was. He was forsaken. Jesus don't lie. Amen. When he said it, he meant it. The Father had turned away from him, literally. Amen. In the English, the phrase God forsaken usually refers to a place unfit for human. I've said it about Arkansas for years. This God forsaken place. I thought about it with you, Tommy, when I was down there hunting in Freer. Everything there either bit you, stung you, or, 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 or tried to eat you. Amen. God forsaken. Amen. That's usually what we think of. But we do not literally mean God forsaken, even though that's what we say. It was true, Jesus. He was the first and only God forsaken person in history. A father's chief duty as a dad, you know, I've gone out of my way for all five of my kids more than once. And we'll continue to do that because that, that's our duty. This is the only time Jesus addressed God as my God. He never said it any other place. Here he said, my God. Everywhere else he called him Father. But, but here he said, my God, because the father-son relationship had been broken at that moment. Amen. It's temporary, but it was broken. It's the chief duty of a parent to take care of their children, to do their best to ensure that their kids do not suffer needlessly. You know, will we not do anything that's in our power to spare them? We do. Amen. We come up and we try to be maybe better than maybe our parents were to us. And we try to protect them and look after them. Sometimes that means a, a spanking. Sometimes it means boundaries. Sometimes it means taking away from some. Other times it just means simply loving them through their foolishness. Can I get an amen? So in time and eternity, that brings us to this great question. Why would God do such a thing? One observation will help us find the answer. Something must have happened that day at that time that caused a fundamental change. He could have stayed mute, but he didn't. He spoke out. It seems like almost now, now he's hurting enough to lash out, but he's saying something that needed to, to have taken place, actually something that took place many years, 1,500 years before Jesus even showed up. He's laying out. The prophetic word that had already been spoken about him. You know, change in the father's relationship with the son. Something had to happen. At that precise moment, Jesus, I can't imagine it, was bearing the sins of the world. How, how do you, you realize how hard it is first for you just to bear your own sins? Amen. Your own failures, your own misgivings, your, your own statements you've made, your own frustrations. Amen. You're just dealing with you. But now you've got to take on Richards and Davids and Josephs. My God, HD. Amen. What, what You're bearing the sins of the world. Amen. And it's being poured on you from, from the beginning of time and to that which is going to take place to the Omega, if you would. Those times, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible says of him. But to slay it itself didn't happen. Till a specific time. All through Scripture. And I, now, if you've not seen what James Barnes has built about the tabernacle, you need to look at it. He built a beautiful display to teach the kids about the tabernacle. The tabernacle had everything to do with lambs slain for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Uh, goats, scapegoats, amen, had to do with our being remitted, our sins being remitted, being pushed forward. All that took place. But at this moment, and this is the amazing time, Jesus' crucifixion didn't take place the week before Passover or the week after. It took place on Passover. Amen. So God set a time, he set a day to put it in the Jewish mind and in the Romans that were there that when Jesus was dying on the cross, they were literally slaying sheep. Hmm. They're in the temple to forgive people of their sins. That's the amazing and yet blindness of the people of that day. So here's Jesus, the Bible says, slain from the foundation. The death of Christ was a historical event in every sense of the word. 
but it's historical with eternal implications. The disjointed trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. What would cause a father to forsake his own son? Let's go back into the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 12. O Lord, are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? We will not die, O Lord. You have appointed them to execute judgment. O rock, you have ordained them to punish. Verse 13, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. Now we're getting a glimpse. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? The Scripture teaches us right at this moment that God, his eyes are too pure to look on evil. God's holiness demands that he turn away from sin. I mean, God will have no part of it. When God looked down and saw his son bearing the sin of the world, he didn't see his son. He saw my sin. He saw your sin. He saw the sins of the world being put upon his son. That's what he saw. He saw instead of that, amen, and he turned away. The sins of the world were put upon the slain lamb. At that moment, not in anger. He wasn't mad at his son. Uh Uh-uh. No. No, no, no. No, he was proud of that boy. But at that moment, he turned away. He loved his son as much at that moment as he ever had. But he turned away in anger over all the sin of the world that sent his son to the cross. Many times, we're not careful. We make light of the cross. You can't do that, church. He turned away in sorrow and deepest pain when he saw what sin had done. He turned away in complete revulsion at the ugliness of sin. When did... When he did that, Jesus was completely forsaken, completely alone. Amen. God forsaken, abandoned, deserted, disowned. It's true. When Jesus bore the sins of the world, he bore them all alone, had no help. But before that, he released a thief. He released his mother. Amen. He walked through this thing. He spoke. He didn't stay mute. Amen. The sins of the world being poured upon him, he became sin for us. Let me just pause and let you think of that. Every evil, wicked thought, thing you've done, person you know that's done it, everybody that's repented, amen, was because of that moment that we could. Mm. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. People ask me at times, Pastor, what you know good? I say only one. The rest of us are a mess. Amen. I only know one good. Hallelujah. And he took our sins for us, made sin. Galatians 3, 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. When Jesus was baptized, the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. No longer would that voice say that at the cross. The beloved Son became a curse for us. Isaiah 53, 6, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Iniquity is not just your sins, it's your daddy's sins. See, iniquity is a curse that followed you. You know, I, whether you say it or not, Richard, Richard told me last night, he said, every now and then I realize I'm getting to be a lot like my daddy. Have y'all seen that commercial about that guy that's trying to teach folk not to be like their daddies and their parents? Amen. Have you ever looked in the mirror as you're getting old and realize you are more like your mom and daddy than you ever dreamed you were? There's a lot of good things about your mom and daddy I'm sure passed down to you. But I can tell you something else. The sins of the father seem to chase us. And we got to get ready for it and prepare for it. He said, let me tell you something. I'll take away the iniquity. I'll take away the sins of your daddies. Amen. Your daddies, daddies. Huh? I'll let you start all over again. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Laid on him. Took it for you and me. Jesus became a curse for us. He died in our place. And all our sins were laid on him. For it was for that reason and only that reason that God the Father forsook him. Isaiah chapter 53. Listen, I got into a place this week. Still trying to get used to these. I got into a place this week. Well, I was reading Isaiah 53 out of the message. And you know, the message speaks to me. And I was telling my pastor on the way here, I could just back away. I could say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And just read Isaiah 53 and let it preach itself. This was written 1,500 years plus before Jesus showed up on earth, before he was ever crucified. It was a, it was a newsprint, Isaiah said. And when he wrote it, 
it hit me, man. I mean, I'm walking through it. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Ooh, come on, Jesus. Through his bruises, we get healed. And Peter later picked up on that and said, by his stripes, we were healed. Amen. That the beating he took on his back was for our healing. Hallelujah. Keep rolling here now. Stay ahead. He was beaten. Hold on. 1,500 years before Jesus showed up, Isaiah said, I've got this prophetic word that God just gave. The father just told me that when his son shows up, he's going to be beaten. He was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Mm. Like a lamb taken to the slaughter and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Come on. Justice miscarried, and he was led off. And did anyone really know what was happening? They didn't. He died without a thought of his own welfare, beaten, bloody, for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked. They threw him in a grave, says, with a rich man. How many know that was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb? I tell you again, if you're not going to stay there, rent it. If you're not going to keep driving it, rent it. He just borrowed it. For three days. He didn't need it for any longer than that. Amen. So for that moment, a thought for his own wealth, beaten, bloody for the sin, buried with the wicked, threw him in a grave where the rich man, even though he had never heard a soul or said one word that wasn't true. What happened on that day, according to Isaiah 53:10, is that God emptied the sewer. It had, oh, it's repulsive. Isn't it? Has anybody ever told you? The commode stopped up. The sewer stopped up, David. Somebody, got, and not only is it stopped up, it's backed up. It's been rolling back. And for some reason, folk keep using it, and it keeps backing up. And the sins, all the wickedness of the world begin to back up. Amen. And when he died on the cross, it was empty. I know it's, it's graphic to think about, but it was emptied on him. He bore our sins. Amen. He took our iniquities. Verse 10, Isaiah 53, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Be sin for us, become a curse for us. He laid on it the iniquity of his heart. Imagine that somewhere in the universe there was a cesspool that backed up. Amen. It was full of, of murder and hatred and theft and adultery and drunkenness and bitterness and greed and gluttony and all the drug abuse and all the crime, cursing every vile deed, every wicked thought, every vain imagination. All of it at that moment was laid upon him. I got to start closing here. There are two great implications here. First, I want to tell you, never minimize the horror of our sin. Never minimize it. Every time you turn on the news, you see sin. Amen. You see destructiveness. You search the internet, you find it. Amen. Whether it be wars and rumors of wars, whether it be hatred and meanness throughout the world, sometimes we laugh at sin. We, back in the day, there was this old boy back before men dressing up like women was popular uh, named Flip Wilson. Flip would say, the devil made me do it. Amen. We blame his stuff on the devil. Hallelujah. When we did it, our, so we, we, we poked fun of it. It was our way our, our sin that Jesus bore that day it was our sin that caused the Father to turn away from the Son. It was our sin floating in the cesspool of iniquity. He became a curse, and we were part of the reason. Don't joke about it. Second, we must never minimize the high cost of our salvation. Woo! Jesus paid it all. We say it, we sing it, but he paid it all. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. Hallelujah. He did all that for us. Don't minimize it. Is it possible that some believers become tired of hearing about the cross? Pastor, I've heard you preach about this every year. I've been with you, Cheryl, for 25 years. You preach it every time. I, I told, uh, I told uh, my wife this week, I said, you know, some people, I, I appreciate all these teachers back here. Some of these teachers have been teaching at this college 25, 30, 40 years. They better know their subject. 
Amen. I don't throw accolades at them. They're teaching the same thing every year to a different kid. Can I get an amen? So every year when I preach this, hallelujah, I say, God, give me something new. Give me something I hadn't thought about. Let it mean something more to me this year than it did last year. Amen. I ought to know the subject. Amen. I've been preaching it long enough, but it never gets old to me. Amen. I can preach it again next Sunday. The cross. He old. I old. He paid. Without the awful pain of the cross, there'd be no happy things to talk about, no forgiveness, no salvation. Amen. We'd be lost forever. Well, Pastor, where was God then? When the cry from the cross is for all the lonely people of the world. That's for the abandoned child, the widow, the divorce he's struggling to make ends meet, the mother standing over the bed of her suffering daughter, the father out of work, the parents left alone, the prisoner in his cell, the aged who languish in convalescent homes. For the man or the woman who's struggling with dementia and don't even know it, my God, my God. Singles who celebrate birthdays alone. It's the word from the cross for you. No one has ever been as alone as Jesus. You will never be forsaken as he was. No cry of your pain will not be heard. The cry of his pain when God turned his back. He was forsaken that we might not be forsaken. Abandoned that we might not be abandoned. Deserted that we might not be deserted. Forgotten that we'll never be forgotten. That's why I tell everybody, don't go to hell. Don't do it, man. Amen. Don't do it. I mean, I hear other people tell folk, go to hell. Don't say that. We don't want folk going to hell. Amen. As a believer, you should never tell anybody go to hell. Tell them go to Walmart, but don't go to hell. Listen, if you go to hell, it'd be in spite of what Jesus did for you. He's already been there. He took the blow. He took the pain. He endured the suffering. He took the weight of all our sins. So if you go to hell, don't blame Jesus. It's not his fault. He went to hell so you wouldn't have to. Amen. The worst thing about hell, it's not going to be the fire. It's not going to be the memory of, uh, of your past. It's not going to be the darkness. The worst thing about hell is the one place in the universe where people are utterly fors forever forsaken by God. Hell is truly a God-forsaken place. That's the hell of hell, to be in a place where God has abandoned you for all eternity. Hebrews 13, 5, one of my favorite scriptures, don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Did you know that uh, what I understand is Americans are the, is, uh, America is one of the few countries in the whole world that has storage buildings? Think of that. We love to store our stuff. We love to keep our stuff. Beware. Don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Be relaxed with what you have. Since God assured us, I'll never let you down, never walk off, I'll never leave you. Amen. That's a word to us. Donna, that's a word. Amen. That he'll never leave us. Now I'm going to close with Isaiah again. I got to go back to Isaiah. Let me see where I left off. Where would I leave off? Is it on the overhead? What well, rock on? Waiting on you. Oh, you said that's the last one. Okay, my bad. But well, just let me read to you. Can I do that? He was looked down on and passed over. A man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him. Thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us we thought brought it on himself that God was punishing him for his own failures. I skip down to verse 11. Out of that terrible travail of soul, he'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous ones as he himself carries the burden of their sins. Well, there was the answer in verse 11. Why did he do it? So that he could have many righteous ones. How am I righteous? With the blood of Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Ooh. 
Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to preach your word. Share your heart. Remind your people what you did for them. Jesus, the only forsaken one that we would never be forsaken. In your life right now, if you have felt that God has forsaken you, you have felt that you're in need of a Savior. You, you're like me. Back in the day, I would pray, and I had no idea I would really go to heaven. I just needed help. I just needed to pray. If you've been away from him, just put your hand up right now. Would you do that? Thank you, sir. Amen. Anyone else, just put your hand up right now. Pastor, pray for me today. Amen. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Pray with me. Jesus, you were forsaken that I'll never be forgotten. You were abandoned that I'll never be abandoned. I receive you today. I thank you for your mercies. And let me say with a loud voice, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your sacrifice. It changed my life. It changed my thinking. Help me during pain not to lash out in Jesus' name. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Now, you prayed that. You said it out. You said, well, Pastor, you asked me to say it. I know I did, but I'm going to say it again. It, when you say to yourself, when I'm in pain, God, help me not to lash out. Because I know what happens in pain. But when I read this, did you know I've never, Joseph, I've never said that before. I've never talked about muting from the cross. That's why I like preaching this, Tommy, again and again, because I get another idea. Amen. I get another thought. Hallelujah. You would not believe how wonderful these things are right here, because y'all are the fuzziest looking people I have ever seen. I told my son last night coming in, my son's a good traveling companion. He don't say nothing unless I say something to him. Like, he liked traveling with Richard. Hey, man, that's why we got along so well. This morning, we need, we need to be honest with ourselves, with our, our giving. I mentioned this even last week. It's sacrifice that moves the hand of God. My tithe is not my sacrifice. My over and above is my sacrifice. When I bless those. And we, we, as we move toward the summer, we got still got a lot of things we got to do. Maybe the worst thing I ever said to you was, the church is paid off. Because when you tell somebody something paid off, well, they quit giving toward it. Amen. But your giving was never to pay off the church. Your giving was to honor God. Amen. And so we give our tithe today, our offering. And if there's a need for sacrifice, God, I give over and above. And I want to tell you about it. Lord, I, I don't have a lot. Amen. But this is what I got I want to give. Amen. For the kingdom of God. And then, then have confidence in us that we use it for the right things. This, I don't think this is on, I don't know if it's on the overhead. It's not written home on my paperwork here. But this week is first week midweek. Tuesday night, Eddie B. will be with us. Now, first, oh, there it is. I didn't realize, I didn't see it on the paperwork, Dave, so I won't even mention it. But Eddie, this guy goes to the prisons. He's out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And some of you, how many have heard Eddie already? Yeah. Were you blessed? I was blown away. Amen. I was blown away by this guy. Uh, his, his passion for Jesus, that keeping the fire alive. I know it's like being an evangelist. It's hard to, to keep the fire alive a lot of times. He's done that. Amen. So he'll be with us only Tuesday night here and Wednesday night in, in uh, New Caney. So I'd love to see as many. I know some of you struggled getting here because you live four miles away. I know traffic get a little rough around here. Amen. But when we come from New Caney, I can tell you real quick, traffic got a little worse. Amen. Now, it's, it's easing up. They start to finish these roads and things are happening. But I'd love to have you come out here Tuesday night, amen, to honor the, the, the word of the Lord, amen, and, and be with Eddie and ourselves. Uh, invite somebody. You say, Pastor, I've been waiting on somebody to get. I got born again at, on a Saturday night with some old boys who come up, long hairs that come up from Florida and did a concert in a church, Cherry Hill, Alabama. Amen. That's where I was. Hallelujah. So you know where that is, H? You know exactly where it is. Down from your old high school. So that's where I got born again. I didn't go to hear preaching. I went to a concert. 
God touched my heart. This will be like a concert. Uh, it, it's not so loud it's going to hurt your ears. Well, if it is, we set you in the back like we did today. Peggy. Amen. So uh, everybody get your offering ready. Our servant leaders will come on up. I'm going to say this. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor David, who's praying for turtles. Amen. You can go ahead and pray for spare dogs, too. Somebody drop a dog off. That's, that's sorry. Amen. Be responsible for your pup. Amen. Be. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. I prayed your debts get, get canceled. Amen. You're able to pay everything off. Ain't nothing like living debt free. Ain't nothing like it. Amen. It's a good thing. It's freedom. Amen. You're able to bless other people when you're that way. Hallelujah. Amen.